Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We'll begin reading verse 1, Romans chapter 2 and verse 1, as we continue in our series through the um, book of Romans. Just started it a few weeks ago. You know, last week was Mother's Day, and we had a Mother's Day message. But uh, Romans chapter 2 and verse 1 Smile if you're there. <laughs> Romans chapter 2 and verse 1 Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man. Whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul a man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. And we're going to stop there. We'll cover some more verses in this chapter. But the message this morning is God's righteous judgment. God's righteous judgment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for the uh, powerful truth of, of your righteous judgment here in this passage. And I pray that you'd help, it, help us to get that message and uh, may we apply it to our lives with your help and your grace and power. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. A man wanted to impress his friends with his eye for art as they went to an art gallery together. He forgot his glasses, was nearsighted, and could hardly see his hand in front of his face. But he figured he could wing it with any abstract comments and observations he wanted to make. So he approached a frame and began criticizing why would anyone want to paint something so hideously ugly? I mean, it's a true rendering of the object, but why waste time painting such a disgusting subject? Everyone was laughing by this time as his wife whispered into his ear, John, it's a mirror. <laughs> um, Stephen Covey tells in Seven Habits for Highly Effective People the story of a man who was riding on a bus and was greatly disturbed at a young boy who was running up and down the aisle of the bus screaming and laughing at the top of his lungs while the young boy's dad just sat idly by. The man could not believe that someone would be so rude and inconsiderate of the other people around him. He then began to notice other unflattering things about the man. His hair was unkempt so he was probably homeless and his eyes were bloodshot so he had to be an alcoholic. Finally, not able to take any more of the child, this man went and approached the dad and demanded that he get control of his young son. The dad, seeming to be shaken from a trance, apologized to the man and told him that the boy's mom, his wife, had just died at the hospital after struggling all night. He was trying to think of a way to break the news to the boy. Um, there's a, another, man, another speaker, his name is Chuck Swindoll. He gives several reasons why we shouldn't judge other people, and one is because we don't know all the facts. One time he was preaching at a Christian camp. On the first day, a man approached him and said how much he was looking forward to hearing Dr. Swindoll speak in person for the first time. That evening, Swindoll noticed the man sitting near the front, but only a few minutes into the message, the man was sound asleep. Swindoll thought to himself, maybe the man's tired. After a long day's drive, he can't help himself. But the same thing happened for the next few nights. Pastor Swindoll was getting exasperated. If this guy really wants to hear me preach, why does he keep falling asleep? On the last night, the man's wife came up and apologized for her husband's inattention to the messages. She explained that he had recently been diagnosed with terminal cancer and the medication he was taking to ease the pain made him extremely sleepy. But it was one of his lifelong dreams to hear Dr. Swindoll speak before he died, and now he had fulfilled that goal. What do all three of those things have in common uh, is misjudging, misjudging, uh, misjudging. That, that just because you, something appears to be a certain way does not mean that uh, you know the whole backstory. You don't always know the whole backstory. You don't know why people look the way they do. You don't always know why people do the things they do. 
and, uh, and therefore, at times, we can misjudge and have improper judgment, unrighteous judgment, uh, because of not knowing all of the facts. But thankfully, we have a God whose judgment is always right, and that's the title of the message this morning is God's Righteous Judgment. Um, I was uh, talking with, um, well, they've been here a couple of times, not here this morning, but uh, I had met for the first time with a couple from out of the area, and uh, talking with the husband, and his wife was just sitting there um, falling asleep, <laughs> closing her eyes while, uh, while we were talking. And she didn't do much in any of the talking anyway. And you know what my response was in that particular case, and I'm not saying my judgment is always right when I'm looking at what people are doing and how they're acting. But in this case, after hearing the story and, and knowing a little bit of the background of, of what, had, what had been going on in their lives, I thought, this person's probably really tired and worn out. And you know what? If she wants to close her eyes and fall asleep while we're, I'm talking with the husband, I mean, more power to her. She just might need a peaceful place to sit here. And if this is peaceful enough that she can rest and, and get, some, uh, get some rest, now, that doesn't mean don't fall asleep during the message. Um, but uh, well, during our conversation, then fine, that's fine. Um, now, if you're in here falling asleep because you have some bad habits that need to get right, we well, need to take care of the bad habits. You know, don't stay up too late on Saturday night or, you know, whatever the case might be. Um, but uh, there are times when people do things that, that may look out of place and you don't always know why they're doing what they do. But uh, you, just, you just never know. You just never know. Sometimes you do know, actually. Sometimes you do know. You find out. Um, and uh, I was also, there's a congresswoman here in Massachusetts who has her, all of her hair shaved off. Now, she's not a godly congresswoman. and She's, she's got a, um, uh, let's just say, pretty much all of her values and things she's for are mostly different from most Christians. And you could, some people shave their he heads because of, out of rebellion. When I was younger and someone in our church, she came into church uh, with her head, with her hair, her head all shaved. That was just because she was, uh, it, was a, it was an act of rebellion and there was some emotional, spiritual, major problems there. Well, this particular person, I thought, why, is she, why does she have her head shaved? And so I looked up this congresswoman and she has some condition or some, something that uh, had to do with, you know, maybe I don't know if her hair falling out or it, it was something physical that was going on where you might disagree. I might disagree strongly with the congresswoman's positions, but I'm not going to cast judgment upon why, didn't, why in the world does she have her head shaved because she actually has a medical reason to have her head shaved. So there are things that we refrain from casting judgment and, and, and exercising uh, judgment until we know what the full story is. And even, even then, we need to recognize it because we are people, we're humans, uh, we're not God, God is God, we're not God, that our judgment is never, uh, th th there will never be a time when our judgment is always 100% right. Now, I, I, I think Christians, and we'll kind of get into this a little bit, but Christians should exercise good judgment. And we're going to get into what that even means in just a moment. But there are certain things that we don't need to even cast a judgment about at all. Some of these examples that I gave, oh, why is that man uh, sleeping on the front row? Well, if, if, I'm sitting in a, uh, if I'm sitting in a church service and the preacher's preaching, my job is to actually pay attention to the preaching. It's not to be looking around and seeing who's awake and who's asleep. So in that case, it has nothing to do with me. Uh, so in that, in that case, I can just reserve cast and judgment on that person because I'm here because I need to hear the message from God's word. And then what other people are, are doing, as long as they're not causing a disruption or a disturbance in the service, uh, that is something that, is, is, uh, that, that can be taken care of between if there's the pastor of that church who needs to address something or, or, or whatever the case might be. The pastor might know why they're doing what they're doing when other people don't. So just various examples of there are times we don't even need to exercise particular judgment about a particular thing because it really is not in our purview of needing to make a judgment. But a few things about judgment is that God's, uh, first of all, three things about God's 
righteous judgment is. Number one, God's judgment is always right. Now, as it's been two weeks since we were at the end of Romans chapter one, so I just want to remind you that there's a whole list of, of, of all kinds of, of evil things, wicked things that people do, and it's a result of a rejection of God. And, and when a person rejects the Creator God and rejects His Word and, and conscience and creation, and it leads to all kinds of perverse, wicked behavior. And there's this whole list here. And then it says in verse 32 of chapter 1, "...who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them." But then we go right into chapter 2, and it says, Therefore, thou art an excusable man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doeth the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. So God's judgment is always right. So some of us, we might look at people who are committing these things in chapter 1, and, and, and the, the caution here, and I'll kind of save this point, is point's kind of saved for a little bit last, but I'll just give you a little taste of it. The, the caution here is don't be looking down on other people casting judgment and condemning judgment on them when you're doing the same things. That's, it's inconsistent, it's hypocritical. And, and so this, but what I want to focus on for this first point is that we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. So whatever God does, whatever judgments God decides as far as how he deals with people is according to truth. And there are times people don't like what the Bible says about God's judgment and, and God, the consequences that come upon the wicked. People might not like it, but every judgment that God meets out is according to truth. It's always right. God's judgments are never wrong. With us being humans, there are times we exercise wrong judgment. And so we need to get that distinction made is that we're not God. We, can, we at times have uh, wrong judgment. One of the things uh, in our trip this past week um, is, uh, actually, let me, let me go back here a minute and before I say that, that, that judgment is not a bad word. Judgment is not a bad word. In modern day Christianity, judgment is often made out to be a bad word, or not just in, in Christianity modern day, but just in society. Oh, yeah, we, we don't want to be judgmental or against judgmentalism, where the uh, Bible says not to judge. I mean, there's all kinds of these things about that sounds like, oh, judgment is a bad word when it comes to uh, the biblical sense of a Christian, in a Christian sense. I mean, people don't seem to have a problem with watching Judge Judy. She's exercising judgment. I mean, is she being judgmental? You know, no, that's one of the most popular syndicated uh, programs in you know, the long run. I think that show is now ended. But, I mean, people, people go to the courthouse all the time, and there's judgments that are made at the courthouse all the time. Judgment is not a bad thing. What's, what's bad is improper judgment or unjust judgment. But judgment in of itself is not a bad word. And judgment means, simply means it's a verdict or a sentence. Judgment, and oftentimes people in ignorance will equate judgment with condemnation. You can make a judgment without condemning. Because if, our, if, if we are not God, we cannot, we have no power to condemn someone anyway. Because we don't have the power to mete out that punishment that they're being, uh, that, that's because of their condemnation. God has that power. The courts have that power. They are, if someone is condemned, if they're pronounced guilty and then they're condemned to life in prison or condemned to death, there's a governmental structure that actually has the ability to meet that out. They, they have the ability to carry that out. We do not have the ability to carry that out. Now, in very small ways, we might. Parents might have the ability to uh, uh, meet out some punishment or consequences uh, make a judgment about their children. And that's one of the hardest things is in, in, uh, in any part of life is ex exercising proper judgment. Because if you don't exercise proper judgment, then there's, the, there's resentment that builds with whether it's with children or whether it's in some other area uh, because we're being considered uh, unfair. And at times, sometimes children will say you're being unfair anyway and they need to realize life isn't always fair and... Uh, but as far as the judgment we meet out, as far as the, 
the verdict or sentence, verdict or sentence just simply means whether someone is guilty or not guilty, whether something is wrong or right. So if I, we make judgments in life all the time, whether something is good or evil, something is right and wrong. So judgment itself is actually a net, having proper judgment is a very necessary part of life. So it's not a matter, we can't get away from judgment. We need to make sure we are exercising proper judgment in life. And so I, um, going back to what I was going to say, uh, a few, there were a few things. You know, when, when you're taking a trip, uh, there's different decisions you make. Now, if it's just one person traveling or two people traveling, it's, it's really, decisions are less consequential. Uh, little decisions are, are, are less consequential uh, then if you're traveling, there was eight of us, uh, you know, six children, mostly younger, <laughs> traveling. So decisions you make are very consequential. And, uh, and I can look back, and we, we, overall we had a good week. It was a good trip and enjoyed uh, getting out, traveling. But over the course of the week, there were a few things that I just really believed that I exercised bad judgment on in decision making that could, that then had ramifications a little bit later that could have made the trip go a little more smoothly. Now, as the, as the week went on, that got better. <laughs> but I, I, I couldn't believe just how rusty I was at traveling. I mean, just, you know, too, too much. Uh, being, but it was a long trip. You know, it was the longest trip we've had in a long time with our family and the first one we've had with all six uh, children. But, you know, j making proper judgment was an important part because there are consequences. There are good consequences or bad consequences of decisions that you make. Um, and uh, so there were a few, a few things in that. But then there were things that were good, saying good judgment. Wow, that was a good call there. Um, we, and some things just work out. It's just of the Lord it works out. And one of the things we did when we left northern Kentucky, rather than driving all the way to where we were going to stay in a hotel uh, Friday night, I said, well, let's, let's take a little more of the scenic route. And uh, so, so th this is a difference in judgment. On Tuesday, no, it was Wednesday, decided to take a little more of a scenic route from Indiana to northern Kentucky. And that was really the way that all ended up was bad judgment, just with the timing of everything. Uh, now, when my daughter Eliana says she liked that route, I say, well, great, wonderful. <laughs> so that was apparently wasn't all bad. It wasn't a bad way to go. But uh, I was having some problems with Google Maps and I were not getting along that particular day. And it kept exerting its will against me because I, what, I was, what happened was I thought I put in, okay, I want to choose this route. Yes, it's a longer route, but it's the route I want to go. But do you know that Google Maps just at times will arbitrarily just, no, you're going this way because this is shorter. And then other times it will ask you, do you want to go this shorter way? No, there were times it actually changed my route on me. Like when it recalculates, it, it recalculates the shortest route. So Google Maps and I were not getting along at all and made me wish I just had a regular GPS in the van. But uh, that, so what happened was when we, I mean, right off the bat, we're heading in the wrong direction. I mean, it was the right direction if we were taking the shortest route, but it was the wrong direction from the scenic route. It was already scenic anyway. It was a nice way to go. So I made the decision, I'm, I'm going to exert my will back against Google Maps and we're going this other way anyway. In the end, probably wasn't the best idea because it kind of put, it put us getting where we wanted to be later. So it had a little bit of ramification, not terrible ramifications, but n not what we wanted to do. When I should have just said, all right, well, let's just go up in the highway and we're going to go over the quickest way. But then on uh, Friday, we, it, this also uh, necessitated proper judgment. We decided we're going to go down through the um, scenic route, the Ohio River Scenic Byway. And so you go across the river right from Kentucky over into Ohio, and there's, there's this road, and, and it's more of a scenic route right along the Ohio River. And my hope had been that we would, there, there are locks and dams along the Ohio River, and my hope had been that we would be able to stop at one of them, but I wasn't sure because some of them, it's harder, they're harder to get to, and you don't always have access to each of them. We didn't go very long, and we found, we found one of those places, and it was actually set up where we didn't have picnic stuff, but you could actually have picnic there along the river, and you, you have the dam, the hydroelectric dam, and there's the, there's the lock, and, 
And uh, nice, very nice setting, nice setting. So that worked out great. That was good judgment. Boy, that was a good move. And then we got down to a certain point where it's like, okay, now it's time to speed up the trip a little bit. We're done with this scenic byway now, and we're going to head north right up to the highway, and we're going to go over. And so that worked out. Uh, but the, and, and the Lord worked it out, thankfully. Just the timing was great where we got to that place where the lock and dam was, and here's a barge going right into the lock. Just right when we got there, I said, wow, that's perfect timing. I didn't know that we would get to see that. What a wonderful thing. At least I thought it was a wonderful thing. I mean, but I'm the one who gets excited at coal power plants along the river, too. I mean, you know, it is exciting. You know, what's exciting about it. And I told my wife this because one of those plants is a symbol for industrial America, the building of America where it could produce more power. How many solar panels and windmills would you need to equate one of those power plants? That's what I look at. I'm not, not against solar and wind, but I just look at just, the, you see the smokestacks, you see the, to me it's just a beautiful sight because it shows it's a, it was a sign of progress back in the day of the development of America industrially. But anyway, so I, I, I like that personally. Um, so I like the lock and dam. I don't know if anybody else liked seeing it, but I liked it. And the kids liked running around. They had a big grassy area. So that was good judgment. So there's, there, you make good decisions, and sometimes they, you know, they work out, and you make certain decisions, and it doesn't work out very well. And um, so judgment is not, always a bad, is not always a bad thing. We need, as Christians, we need good judgment. And I'm not really getting into so much... Um, because the focus is on God's righteous judgment. Well, how do we get good judgment? We get good judgment by being people of wisdom, and wisdom comes through the Word of God. The more time we spend in the Word of God, the more knowledge we have of God and His principles, the better it's going uh, to have that effect on our minds, and we're going to be able to exercise good judgment. You spend time with the Lord and in His Word, your, judge, your good judgment will increase. Why, why do so many people make foolish decisions? Because they re reject the knowledge of God. They reject God's wisdom. And they make so many foolish decisions. Um, but uh, we can make good decisions as we get more filled with God's word and he gives us wisdom. We are cautioned. The reason we're cautioned about judging is because our judgments are not always right. So it's not that judgment all is always a bad thing. It's just you've got to be careful because your judgments aren't always right. And we're going to come back to Romans in a little bit. But we're going to see... If, couple of different uh, examples of this here. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. This is the most famous judging um, chapter or passage. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. It says, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And then it goes on there that you need to take care of your own issues before you try to help someone with their issues. You might have a bigger issue than they do, but a, we at times can get tunnel vision where we're so focused on the other people's issues that we got we got some big issues of our own we got to take care of. And that's the caution here. Don't, don't ju judge not that you be not judged because the same way that you judge someone else, that judgment's going to come also back on you. And then turn to John chapter 7. Turn to John chapter 7. So that verse is not against judging. You know, how many of you have heard or maybe used at some point, the Bible says not to judge. Matthew 7, 1 says not to judge. Judge not. Judge not. No, it says judge not that ye be not judged. That your judgment that you have um, needs to be in such a way that it's not going to come back on you. Uh, John chapter 7 and verse 23 it says, if a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every, uh, every whit whole on the Sabbath day? And so here are the, uh, the, the uh, Pharisees, the, the, the other the rulers there, the ones that um, were coming against him, that, that the people answering, uh, they are against what Jesus did. He healed someone on the Sabbath, but he's saying, Look, uh, you circumcise on the Sabbath so that you're keeping the law. You're making sure you're keeping the law on the Sabbath day by circumcising. He says, and I've, why are you angry at me? Because I've, I've healed a person. I've healed a man on the Sabbath day. He says in verse 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. 
So their appearance was, oh, he's breaking the law. He's doing other work that, that we don't, uh, that isn't uh, supported on the Sabbath day, that is not uh, uh, approved for the Sabbath day. But yet they do these other things that what was different about him healing somebody than them circumcising according to the law of Moses. It really did. There was no, he's, you're judging according to appearance. You're, you're looking at these two things, seeing that they're so different when really what's wrong with me healing someone on the Sabbath. So he, here he says, judge righteous judgment. He didn't say not to judge. He just said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And so be careful about the verdict or the sentence they are laying down. They were saying he's guilty, he's wrong, when he really wasn't wrong. Uh, the word judgment also uh, can be used uh, as in, in manner. Can, it can be tr uh, translated in manner, right, and discretion. And so it, it goes into that using discretion, having uh, a, a way about you. Uh, that your ways are right, and uh, the Lord's judgments are true and righteous, and we're not going to turn there for sake of time, but Psalm 19, 7 through 10 talks about God's word, and part of that, it says, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. True and righteous altogether. And there's a song that goes with that, a pretty nice song. Uh, More to be desired are they than gold. Um, anybody know that song? Besides Josiah, maybe. Josiah knows it. All right. Maybe we should sing it at the end of the service. Um, teach it to you. But uh, judge, the Lord's judgments are true and righteous. So not only are God, is God's righteous, uh, God, are God's judgments always right, God's righteous judgment doesn't show favoritism. Turn back to Romans chapter 3. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. God's righteous judgment doesn't show favoritism. Verse 3 says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgeth them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? And say, if you're doing the same things they're doing, don't get so high and mighty on yourself that you're somehow going to escape <laughs> that same judgment. You're going to have the same judgment. Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? No, God's just been good to you and given you these opportunities. He's been good to you in your life, and that's that's, that's the best motivation for repentance is just seeing how good God is. Wow, God's so good that why would I not turn to him and get things right? That's the best motivation. I mean, yeah, I mean, you could, it could, there could be a, a little motivation of, oh, boy, God's going to put the hammer down. I better get right with him. And sometimes people need that. They need to, to get a healthy dose of God's judgment and his righteousness and realizing they are going to answer to him. But really, the best motivating factor is, wow, God's, God's so good. God's goodness leads to repentance. And, but he, well, despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance? There are people that do. They don't, they don't see the goodness of God, and they don't want to admit the goodness of God, and, uh, and they don't repent. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds... Notice that the righteous judgment of God will render who will render to every man according to his deeds. So there's going to be no favoritism because God's judgment is, judgment is completely right. And no one who breaks the law will escape the judgment of God, no matter how righteous they think they are. And that's why, and as we'll get into further into Romans, well, that's why we'll see that God made a provision that we could escape the judgment of God, but it was not through our own self-righteousness. And uh, continue reading here in verse 7, To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. And so there are people who go the right path in life, go God's way in life. And then there are people who go the other way in life that are contentious and don't obey the truth. Tribulation and anguish upon uh, every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. So in this case, he's also distinguished and there's no difference between Jew and Gentile when it comes to the righteous judgment of God. But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also the Gentile. So whether if you're if you're going the bad direction, you're rejecting God's commandments, you're rejecting his way of salvation, you're rejecting his his law. This is what's going to come upon you if and no difference, Jew or Gentile makes no difference. If you do obey 
and go God's way, then there is uh, no difference, Jew or Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. God is perfectly just in his dealings, showing no favoritism as for when it comes to uh, right and wrong. He, it's, it's, for the, it's for the Jew and the Gentile. And so nobody's going to, to get around that righteous judgment of God. Just as God judges those who break the law, he judges those who fear him without partiality. I'm, uh, keep your finger there. If you want to turn to Acts 10, you can. I'm going to read a couple of verses there. Uh, in Acts chapter 10 and verse uh, 34 and 35. Acts 10 verses 34 and 35. And this is when uh, the gospel goes in greater extent to a greater extent to the Gentiles. And uh, Peter is testifying of this. Then Peter, op- in verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But notice this in verse 35, But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Every nation. So it doesn't matter what nation you come from. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, your background. God's judgment is the same for everyone. God's righteous judgment doesn't show favoritism. Go back to Romans chapter 2. Number 3, God's righteous judgment sees through hypocrisy. God's righteous judgment sees through hypocrisy. Uh, Romans 2 verse 12, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. This goes back to conscience, having some concept of right and wrong, that the Gentiles who were not exposed to the law of God, that the law was not given directly to them as it was to the nation of Israel, but yet they were still did, because of conscience, they still did things that were in the law without even knowing the law. These having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, behold, thou art called a Jew and resteth in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approveth the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou art thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness." an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest that a man should not steal, dost thou steal? So he's, he's addressing this where they know all of these things and they can teach all of these things. But he's saying, if, even if you're teaching it, are you, uh, are you doing the same thing you're teaching not to do? So he's... he's uh, going to remind them here and tell them that God's judgment sees through hypocrisy. Verse 22, Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast to the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So he's saying you you might even do the things you should do on the outside, but if you've got other areas in which you're breaking the law and you're you're, you're really giving a God a, God a bad name to the, among the Gentiles, the, the 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 circumcision doesn't mean so much because that that was a big thing for the Jews because that's what God had told them to do. Verse 26, Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? So in other words, they they were proud of their circumcision. They were proud of their religious ritual. But he's saying that the Gentiles who are uncircumcised, they are, uh, if they keep the law, the other parts of the law, God, in his justice, in his righteous judgment, he's looking at that as more favorably than you doing that outward ritual and not keeping the law and not doing what is right. 
And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So here he's, he's telling him, look, just because you have Jewish blood in you <laughs> does not mean you get a free pass with God. It does not mean that you, uh, you, you, might, you might do what a Jew does as far as circumcision, but if you're there breaking the rest of the law and you're disobeying God's word, uh, really, God's looking in at the heart. So the, he is a Jew which is one inwardly. It comes from the heart. What, what was really God looking for in their lives? not just some outward performance, not just some outward ritual, and not with them just being proud of their bloodline. <laughs> uh, oh, yes, we're, we're of this certain bloodline, and so we are uh, maybe somehow, are, are they somehow exempted from God's judgment? No. Because God's looking at what's in your heart. And so from a spiritual standpoint, and notice that is that of the heart and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. So they were worried about keeping the letter of certain laws, but they were missing then the spirit of the law. They saying those who have the actual heart toward the spirit of the laws are in a better place than those who are just doing these outward, uh, this outward conformity to the law. Whose praise is not of men, but of God. The Gentiles who didn't have the law of Moses still perished because they had the law of nature and had an idea of right and wrong. Many of the Jews were zealous about keeping the law, but still broke the law. This was a bad testimony to the Gentiles. And let's go back to one more passage, Matthew chapter 7, back where we were before. and We'll read a few more verses. So they're all zealous, zealous about keeping the law. Wow, they keep taking pride in, oh, God chose us. He gave us the law. But they still were breakers of the law. They were not so self-righteous as they thought they were. And so God's judgment was going to be fair for everybody. It was going to be just for everybody, Jew or Gentile. Uh, Matthew 7, start at verse 1 again. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast, the moat, cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. And think about how bad of a testimony that is. Not just between Jew and Gentile. But think about if, let's say there's um, you know, a group of Christians. Let's just, use, you know, let's just generically say a church. You have a particular church, and that church is so filled with people who are zealous about God's word. Oh, they, they believe in calling sin what it is and calling out the sin of the world, and they're really zealous of that. And then all of a sudden, I mean, there's all kinds of scandal and corruption and fighting, contention in that church. And uh, they're, once again, so fixated on, oh, just how, look how wicked that world is. Look at how wicked and straining at every little thing. And what a bad testimony that is to the world. But then to bring it in here, it says, thy brother's eye, bring it down a little closer, Think about what that looks like within a church where you've got a person or multiple people who have these, in God's sight, you know, let's say huge glaring issues by, by comparison. Glaring issues, big problems. And yet they're the type of person who will go around, they'll look at everybody's life and strain at the smallest thing. And they, boy, they know how to pick out every little fault of someone else. But yet there they are with these obvious, obvious problems that they need to get right. And yet they're so blinded by their own improper judgment of other people that they don't see clearly. They're, they're so blinded by their own problems that they, don't, they can't see clearly to help anybody else. Now, they, they think they're helping other people. Oh, yeah, I'm pointing out every little issue. 
Yep, you're real, really being zealous for the things that are right, at least in their mind, things that are right. And you know, people who are like that, they pick and choose what's most important to them. They pick and choose what's most important to them. They might make a big, big deal about some things, and then there's other things that are very important, and somehow that's just not as important because it's all about my judgment. It's my judgment, whoever the person is, their judgment. And that's the sign of a person who's got, they've got a beam coming out of their own eye because they can't see clearly to help anybody else with their issues that they have. And by the way, if a person doesn't see their own issues, you're not going to really be in a, much of a position to help them with their issues until they're willing to address some of the issues in their life. But you know, the person with the beam out of their own eye is, and maybe you heard it said this way, as they're, as they're looking around, they've got the beam sticking out of their own eye and they're whacking other people with that beam. <laughs> But it's a bad testimony. It's a bad testimony. It, it creates a self-righteous spirit in the church when you have people who think they are the resident judge. Uh, when they think they're Judge Judy. Or Judge Jerry. Was her name? Her husband's name was Jerry, I think. Uh, he was a judge, too. But... Um, So we need to first of all see God's judgment. That's the main point of the message. God's judgment is perfectly righteous. So if we are going to be people who exercise proper judgment, we need to get more of the mind of the Lord on things. We need to be in his word. We need to have his wisdom working in our lives so that we can exercise proper judgment. Not so then we can turn it around and use it on other people. We first need proper judgment in just how we live our own lives. And then we, live, we have proper judgment in how we live our own lives. Then we might be able to turn around and actually might use proper judgment in helping someone else when they realize, oh, I need some help. I need some guidance. And that's the best opportunity. Then all of a sudden, here's, here's a church with people with good judgment and here people need help. And now all of a sudden, you're really helping people because we got the beams out of our eye and then we've got the right judgment of the Lord working. But we never should get self-righteous about it because we are not God. And so there are times our judgment may very well be wrong. And we need to be humble enough to admit that when we made improper judgments. And then determine, okay, with God's help, I want to I make better judgments in life. And then there are times we need not cast a judgment, may have to make a determination. Because you just don't know what a person might be going through. Maybe get to know them a little better just to care about them, not to, not to fix them, not to uh, try to delve in and get, get the juicy stuff out of their life, but just because you care about them, get to know them a little more. And then you might just open up the door where you see clearly now of why things are in their life the way they are. And maybe then you can be a blessing and encouragement and help to that person. But don't be self-righteous about it. Don't get prideful about, oh, I've got the good judgment because, oh boy, you're, you know what the Bible says, your fall is coming if you get prideful about your good judgment. Because <laughs> maybe you do have good judgment. Maybe you have excellent judgment. But then you get prideful about it. Sorry, you're in the same boat there. You're, you're not going to be in a good condition. <laughs> you might have all the good judgment in the world, but you're exercising bad judgment about getting prideful about it. And let's be a people who recognize judgment itself is not a bad thing. Judgment itself is a good thing. But we need to recognize our limitations in the judgment we can exercise and trust in the one who has absolute perfect judgment. And that's the message this world needs to hear as well, that there is, gonna, there is no respect of persons with God. Everybody's going to answer to God the same way on the same level ground. And maybe you're here today and you've never come to the place where You've trusted in God's remedy for escaping his judgment. Well, God's remedy for escaping his judgment was that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. So that he, he took that, he took all the, 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 your sin upon himself and he paid that, he paid the death penalty for you. He shed his blood for you, but you've never trusted in him as your savior. If there's someone here like that, you've never been saved. Today's the day you can know for sure you'll escape the judgment of God. You'll escape the wrath of God. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone to save you, to cleanse you from your sin. And by the way, that takes humility. Being willing to admit 
that you actually are a sinner in need of a Savior. Not just that, oh, I, yeah, I've done wrong, but I'm pretty good. No, that you're a sinner in need, that you're that bad of a sinner, worthy of the justice and judgment of God, that you need a Savior. Amen. And you recognize that Jesus is the only one who can save you. If there's someone like that here today, that invitation's open. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. And for everyone else here uh, who is saved, let's commit ourselves today to exercising right judgment and trusting in God whose judgment is always right.